At NEWFM 1027, we're covering uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut for the residents of Rock. And if you're on Eastern Long Island, of course, that would be 1071, of course. All right, probably uh, if you're having a birthday, happy birthday. Of course, we wouldn't want to leave anybody out, but uh, certainly we're back at 1027 NEWFM. And wow, Edgar Winter Group, yes, we found this. See, Jim, it pays to look behind the wall there. You know, everything isn't in the same direction like it's supposed to be. And we found a little free ride. Haven't had that one for a while, and you probably won't get a free ride for a while. Here we go. We're here with Ken Dashow, legendary rock and roll DJ, currently with Q104.3 here in New York. And, of course, let's go back to the olden days, kind of like really what Q104.3 is today, the old WNEW. Well, if you want to go back to the olden days, I was with Marconi on the beach on Cape Cod. He said, kid, hold the wire. And we... Oh, not oh, that not far. That far. <laughs> Let's go back to Scott Muni, Alice and Steele, and Roscoe in those days. Yeah, that's got to be Yeah, let's, uh, the impact that, that, that WNEW really had, it was the time of the Beatles, rock and roll. It was about 10 years after Elvis when WNEW came on the scene. It was really a revolutionary uh, kind of radio station. We have to just remember how fast music progressed, that... You know, people compare the Beatles to, you know, what's the difference between the boy bands or the girl bands today? I mean, they were the ultimate boy band in 1964 when they hit Ed Sullivan. It was uh, One Direction. It was, it, was the, it was the band that every teenage girl was going nuts over. But here's the big difference. Instead of lip syncing, instead of having a team of agents and producers and micromanagers doing synthesized hooks, they had learned how to play. They're playing their own music. It was their own sound. It was their own voices. There was nothing lip synced. It wasn't, uh, you know, professional singer and all you did was dance. It was a real band. And here they've established it. They're at their peak. And what always happens, as it happens now, is a pop group lasts for a couple of years, and then there's a new pop group to take their place. And before that happened, the Beatles changed like everything else changed in the world. Their hair got long. They experimented with drugs. They experimented with the music. And instead of falling apart, it got even bigger. And it was too wild and crazy for an AM station to hold it. AM was holding on to the two-minute pop song. So somebody had to play Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles playing sitar music and traffic and the Who that were getting out of two-minute songs and the doors opening with a six-minute single. And that's how FM was born, and everybody took a chance on something. Nobody had FM tuners when FM radio came, chicken and the egg. People were broadcasting to nobody, and slowly the tuners came to have FM, and people started listening to this wild, crazy, hippie music, and it changed the world. The, they dragged everything forward, and the world followed, and that almost never happens today. Do you think, you know, particularly back then, music, rock and roll is part of the fabric, the society, the, the words meant something. We're in, embroiled in this war called Vietnam. Uh, a lot of the songs were geared towards that. It's something we really don't have today where music is geared toward what's going on in society. You would never have a pop song today referencing the war in Afghanistan, good or bad, because every manager, every agent would say, hey, go stay away from that. That's polarizing. Your goal is to maximize your impressions, social media, and, they, and look at Credence writing a two-minute song called Fortunate Son. Some folks are born silver spoon in hand. Oh, they love to wave the red, white, and blue. It ain't me. That was the anthem of the soldiers in Vietnam. The Doors, you're right, there was them and us, and nobody was afraid to write about what they really felt or what was really going on. Going back to the Beatles and the relationship that the radio station had with the Beatles, in particular Scott Muni, it was very important back then, the DJ and the, the DJ was as almost as big as the rock band or the, the rock and roll artist. You know, in certain ways it was because the DJs were a conduit from the bands to the listeners. You know, there wasn't big money to spend. That's the thing. Nobody was making big money on this. The bands weren't making a lot of money. The promoters weren't making a lot of money. They weren't playing giant stadiums. I mean, Sid Bernstein, who just passed away, the first guy to book a rock stadium show, 1965, with the Beatles. But that was few and far between. He just took a crazy chance on that, and the Beatles launched stadium rock. But for the most part, the only way you knew Crosby, Stills, and Nash were playing is that you were listening to the cool radio station in town, which in New York was WNEW-FM. Let's talk about the DJs, Alice and Steele, Scott Muni. 
you grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Sure. Uh, talk about being a kid listening to these guys at the radio station. It was everything to me because I grew up as a, there were two AM stations. There was MCA, who were the good guys, and ABC with the All-Americans. And I was an MCA good guy. You know, you pick one or the other. And it was great pop music. And it was Paul Simon and Beach Boys and Beatles and on and on. Just great top 40 hits. And then as I turned 15, 16, one of the older kids in high school in poly prep said to me, you know, do you listen to FM? Like, well, I don't really know. He goes, you should listen to a station at 1027. It's called WNEWFM. And nobody was screaming. And there were no jingles. There were no jingle singers. There was no reverb. It was just a person talking to you like another person. Instead of, hey, everybody, how we doing? It's the, it was just someone saying, hi, how was your day? So here's what happened to me today. There's an amazing new record out. I want you to listen to this. And that rocked my world, that you could just talk to another person like a human being on the radio. And as much as I love radio, as a little kid and thought, wow, I want to do that, when I heard NEW, that's when I said, oh, I really want to do that. So you're a kid in Brooklyn listening to Scott Muni, The Beatles, on WNEW-FM. How did you make, say, your hobby or your enjoyment into a career? You know, I, there's, a, there's a sense now of instantaneous gratification and instant success, and it makes me feel like an old codger. But you see, you, you win the celebrity apprentice. You win things. You're immediately the president of the company or you're out. And life just doesn't happen like that. You have to learn. You have to get hard work. So I built a high school radio station. We didn't have any money. And I said to our headmaster, if I could buy the equipment, would you give us a room? So I had bake sale after bake sale and sold pizza until we had a couple of thousand bucks and we could buy a four watt transmitter. And he gave us a room. And from that little radio station, I worked hard and tried to refine and would listen to what I was doing. And for college, I figured every school has teachers and classrooms. All that mattered was the radio station and the theater, because I'm also a theater guy. And I figured that's all that matters. And I found Hobart College, because it had gorgeous theater, and the radio station had carpeted walls and LED boards. I'm like, this is heaven. That, I'm sure there's some good teachers. And our guidance counselor recommended that school for me, and kind of an artsy-fartsy guy, went there. And as opposed to, they gave us this speech about, you know, you can intern at the radio station, and if you still want to do this, uh, we'll take you to Syracuse at the end of the year, and you can take a test to get your FCC license. Well, I read up all about, about what you had to do, and you had to have a Class three license, and there was a test. So before I went to Hobart, I rode away to the FCC, and where to take the test and a study guide, and I studied all that summer. I took my test, and I passed before I went to Hobart. So I went up that first week, and I said, I have my license. And they looked at it and said, do you want to work this weekend? <laughs> so I did every show there was to do in college. I was just on the air constantly. I did, did three plays, did that, and there wasn't much else to do at Hobart. And I was in that mindset. I wasn't there to drink, and I wasn't there to party. And I'm not even putting down people who do, but I was just in that go mode. Even at 18, it was just go, 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 make this happen, make this happen, make this happen. So I spent a year in Hobart, felt I did everything I could, transferred to NYU for film and theater. And while I was going to NYU, I sent out all those tapes that I made and got my first job in Newton, New Jersey, a little country and western station, Cousin Ken. And so I was going to school during the week and DJing on the weekends. And that's kind of how I got going and maybe got ahead of a few other people just because I was just trying as hard as I could. So you had this burning desire really in your soul that you knew this is what you wanted to do with your life and your career yeah. and you know today if you wanted to do a radio show it's a couple of clicks and browses and you have your own show on the internet and you actually built something up from scratch and it, it, it certainly helped you later on in your career because you knew the structure of a radio station and what it was about. It, without a doubt it, it's a learning process and I see it today with interns at the radio station. There's some people who intern here and they have no idea why they're doing it. They don't want to be here, or they just sit here eating candy, and you have to ask them to do something three times. And I can never figure that out. You're taking the spot of somebody who really wants to be here. And there's an intern I have now and some others along the way. They're going to be great at it because they, they're, I see myself in them, of somebody who walks into a studio going, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? And I, it just thrills me when I see students. And it doesn't matter if it's radio 
or the jewelry business or you know the the food business if you want if you're just passionate about what you want to do and just work as hard as you can you know you will learn good things will come so take us now you with Hobart College you go on to NYU let's talk about your first break before you got into WNEW from F from New Jersey cousin Ken Barbara Mandrell still sleeping single in that <laughs> double bed I can't believe that she's so pretty uh, I got to, that was for $1.85 an hour. So you're, you're a DJ making $1.85 an hour. Yes. I lived in Brooklyn, and by the time we went over the Verrazano Bridge, Which was tolls. Which 30, 30 cents then? Okay. Yeah, it was probably about Maybe a buck, buck and a half, yeah. $2 each way. Basically, I lost $5 a show working there. And then I saw a job out in Riverhead, Long Island, which was 10 miles further, but I had a, I had a 69 Cutlass the family hand-me-down car, and the speedometer had broken it a quarter of a million miles. And, and I'm not making that number up. That's really where the speedometer broke. It burned equal oil and gas. Well, this you, is before we leased cars. So yeah, that's what people and you on. just, you know, and just, I thought maybe I could make it, and it did. So I, would, I drove out there because it was a rock station. How many people doubled their salary from their first to the second job? I was getting 380 an hour. So, you know, not too shabby, 390. So I did that for about a year and a half. And my big break came, though, uh, summer of 82, uh, WAPP, Doubleday, was in broadcasting. Apple. And they wanted to get into New York. And it was the Apple. And they did commercial-free summer. And, you know, lesson for everyone out there, for all you students, for anyone. Uh, I was working weekends. And in the trades, I heard this was coming. Whoever was even mentioned as possibly being a program director or a music director, I sent them my air check. And back then, it was not digital. We didn't have computers. So you'd send a cassette, and I sent it with a, a cookies or whatever, and I sent it to everyone in hopes that you're coming to New York. I want to be part of your team. And I must have sent out 10 different cassettes. And then when they got to New York, when they were out in Long Island, I sent it there with more cookies. And the person I have to thank the most is the newsman who worked there, who was a dear friend, who said to me, so my partner, the morning guy, was offered weekends at this station at WAPP. And he's going to turn them down because he said, quote, I'm a morning man. I'm not a weekend guy. The second he calls them, I'm calling you and you call them. And I'll never forget this guy, Bob Clifford, for telling me that, that he said, call now. And I called and I said, so I heard you've got an opening for weekends. And uh, I work at RCN in Long Island. And I live 25 minutes from the station. I can be there. You have my take. Believe me, whatever box you have, it's in there, Ken Dasho. And they said, okay, thanks. And I thought nothing of it. And I went to the fridge, and I poured a glass of orange juice. And before I finished the glass of orange juice, the phone rang. And the program director, Dave Hamilton, said, nice pipes, meaning my voice. He goes, can you really get here in 25 minutes? I said, time me. And I jumped in the car and got there in like 20. <laughs> I mean, I think the cops are still chasing me on the Long Island <laughs> Expressway. And he said... Wow, that's perfect timing. Uh, he said, so, yeah, you want to do weekends? Sure. And as it always happens with startups, by the time it all dust all settled, it wasn't weekends. I was the nighttime DJ. You know, and, and it's that, that thing of never miss an opportunity. Don't ever let your ego take out an opportunity to move forward. Well, I beat the drum and hold the 